Hello, and the Lord be with you as we dig into our Old Testament reading from last Sunday, Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 15. And uh, here is where we not only hear the aftermath of, of the uh, eating of the forbidden fruit, and we don't know what kind of fruit it was. I've heard everybody argue it's everything from an apple, which was popular throughout Western iconography, to maybe a peach or maybe an apricot or these sorts of things along the way. Who knows? And what it is isn't really as important as it is that, um, you know, it, it, it's more the reality that that through the word of the devil, the brokenness, the broken word of the devil joined with the fruit of the tree, you know, the fruit, and you have basically the sacrament that introduces evil into the world, or really it's an anti-sacrament. And here we see the results of it in the reading that follows from Genesis chapter 3. And this is where the, um, you know, the whole bigger picture of the, the scriptures, where the fruit of the tree, the cross, the body and blood of Jesus becomes the source of eternal life um, as it's given, distributed in the Lord's Supper. Um, that's why one of the early church writers trained and ordained by the Apostle John, his name was Ignatius of Antioch. He died and was martyred roughly around 110 A.D., um, shortly after John himself was, was uh, well, not, John wasn't martyred, but John died his own natural death. Um, you know, Ignatius of Antioch, who we know about because he was, uh, you know, a major pastor, a bishop that served a territory of churches in modern-day Turkey. And he wrote letters to each and every one of them um, as he passed by and was taken in chains to Rome, where eventually he was he was put to death for, for his Christian faith. But... Ignatius refers to the Lord's Supper as that medicine of immortality that wards off death to life everlasting. Now, how's that for a mouthful? Um, and, and that's really what it is, um, where the cross and Jesus and the fruit of the cross, his body and blood become, um, you know, the water and the blood that pours from his side, the baptism and Holy Communion. They become that, um, that, that fruit of the tree of life through which we have not only access to the, hearting, uh, the beating heart of God, but then also to, to that gift of eternal life. As we listen to all of this here from the Genesis passage, however, we get to see, um, you know, in, in its initial form, what, what um, the impact and the effect of sin had on Adam and Eve and then upon the whole of creation. And, and it's beautifully wrapped up in that word, enmity. Um, and so as we read through this passage, keep your eyes open for that word enmity, because that's that sense of, um, you know, rivalry, argumentation, you know, fighting against one another that um, not only happened there between Adam and Eve, and then Adam and Eve and all of creation, including the serpent there, but then even you know, the way we take a look at the way in which life and society is not always a pleasant thing, but there's always that struggle involved. And, uh, you know, looking at, you know, the public sphere and politics and social politics and cultural politics and identity politics and all of those sorts of things, there's enmity, 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 and it all goes back to this. So let's begin as we read this, looking at our own lives, um, you know, with that view towards that spiritual struggle that, that uh, is encapsulated in the colic prayer from Sunday, um, in order to wrestle with our own brokenness um, in the light of, of God's grace. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you that through the witness of the scriptures, not only that you provide us that history of our fallen humanity, but also the way in which you spoke those words of promise right from right from the beginning in the Garden of Eden about the one that would be born as the seed of the woman to crush the serpent's head. So that as we hear and reflect upon not only, you know, the way in which our world and our lives are, are, are riddled with so many, so many um, ways in which we fight against one another, and we fight against God and even his word. Um, guide us by that self-same spirit that you speak to us with in those scriptures in order to lead us and direct us to that gift of salvation in Christ Jesus so that we would not only die to ourselves and die with Christ taking up our own cross but that also we would be renewed and strengthened and raised to that gift of eternal life with him. All this we pray in the name of Jesus your son. Amen. 
All right. You know, so often as we learn this passage, we teach it in Sunday school, and it's a wonderful passage to teach. We talk about just where the origin of sin came from, and as a result, you know, we we sort of look at it as a historicized thing rather than looking at it in terms of this this um, this roadmap even for ourselves, where we get to see our own stubbornness and brokenness because of sin in the same way that it hit Adam and Eve. So here, as we listen, verse 8, um, they, Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man hid his, uh, the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, normally before this, basically Adam and Eve, when God came, um, they would be there and they would converse with him face to face because, you know, that was the relationship that God had before you know, the eating of that fruit from the tree. But recognizing that, um, you know, the, the shame, the guilt, the, the enmity that comes into play, um, all of this in relationship to God, because they had broken his, you know, his command, and they took from the tree that they were not supposed to eat from, deceived by the serpent, the voice of the devil, saying, oh, you'll become like God, and all of these sorts of things, knowing good and evil. Um, they became aware of their own brokenness, and so they hid in the garden. And this becomes one of those things that we do um, naturally in our lives when, when we've sinned or when we're aware of sin. Shame and guilt takes its place or even sometimes it's masked under anger or, you know, all kinds of things, pridefulness, so that um, we hide from the people that we've sinned against or we hide from the people that have sinned against us. Notice how that happens within our lives. And the way that it shows up here, though, most importantly is, is it also means that we hide from God. We think that God doesn't see our sins. It's one of the things that creeps in so that we think, yeah, 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 yeah. we pay attention to those ones over there. No, we think that God somehow doesn't see our own brokenness because we somehow blind ourselves to it so that we're hiding from it. And then along the way, we, we kind of think that, um, you know, it, it's it's not really that serious and we tell ourselves all these sorts of things along the way um i, I know plenty of people that have started down that path and basically then caught up with all kinds of other cultural narratives well where you know culturally people would lo love to have this idea that scripture and the revelation that comes to us from scripture is somehow just a human word and it's human opinions and so as a result we can tinker with it the way we like. And if you really want to be a Christian, you know, just th that's okay. Hold to those private beliefs, but, but um, you know, you, you need to get with the program where everything is at. Um, all of these kinds of narratives and all of these ways of talking really distracts us from the fundamental problem of our brokenness. And the way that scripture reveals it, that it is a brokenness that puts us not only at enmity with one another, but then also with God. So that as we hear those words, and as we consider where all of these things that we wrestle with and struggle with come from, it comes right here that we've inherited it from Adam and Eve in the garden, and we have no ability to free ourselves from it. Only Christ can do that, and as he works not only through the means of grace, where he ties us into his death and resurrection, but then also as the Holy Spirit continues to work that gift of repentance in our lives. So here, are we hiding from God becomes one of those interesting questions for us to wrestle with. Or are we trying to hide particular sins from God? Um, we all have them. And as mentioned yesterday in, in the, you know, my, my post on 2 Corinthians 4, um, you know, the way pridefulness so easily becomes the way in which, you know, we um, we, we try to parade in our pridefulness in the way Augustine pointed out, and he was very wise in pointing this out. Um, pride is the, the only sin that parades as a virtue. It's an interesting kind of a thing because we, rather than, you know, coming terms, you know, we're face to face uh, and coming to terms with our brokenness, um, we, we mask it over and say, and we compare where we say, look at how good I am. I'm really great. What do you mean I don't have, I mean, what do you mean these things over here are sins? No, 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 don't look at those. You know, just look at the good things that I want to present. And um, it, it becomes this, this horrendous kind of a, a distortion of our, our human character based on 
um, this hiding from God and and even in you know um, you know that, that enmity towards God where we we try to intimidate God by saying what do you mean I shouldn't be the way that I am you know like a mama bear trying to defend her cubs um, no it doesn't work you can't really do that with the Almighty and get away with it in an ultimate sense so here Adam and Eve hid themselves from the Lord God as he came walking in the garden as he normally would. God is out there. He knows, he sees, and he's very much present in the world. And we sometimes fool ourselves into thinking that the world is secular and God has nothing to do with that or with what I do or, you know, all these sorts of things. Yes, he does. He sees. He's there. The Lord God is walking in the midst of our world wherever we are. And the trouble is, is that we find all kinds of sophisticated ways of hiding. Verse 9, <clears throat> the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Not that the Lord didn't know, but he's trying to tease Adam and Eve out. He says, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So at least he's being honest with that. Okay, so Adam is being honest. I heard you walking, coming around, and because I was naked, I went and hid. Okay, the sense of shame, um, but also naked in the sense of being exposed. Okay. The Lord sees us. Verse 11, he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Now notice, God comes gently in order to try and tease Adam out. And as Adam answers, tries to tease him out and tease out a confession. He's asking for confession. Who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree I told you not to eat from? And the answer in confession would be, yes, Lord, I have sinned. Lord, have mercy. But that's not what he does. Instead, we see the beginning of that enmity. So that rather than saying, yes, coming up front and honest, no ifs, ands, or buts, he says, the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. So he's saying, the woman over there, don't look at me. Notice he's hiding. So he's not being honest with himself. He's hiding and he's saying, no, nope, the woman. So first they hide from God. Second, he hides from himself. So the woman that you gave to me. But he's not only blaming Eve, but he's actually blaming God because he's saying, you gave her to me. And because you gave her to me, and then she gave me from the fruit, then, and I ate, really, it's, it's your fault. Um, very much in the way in which the world today is, you know, well, God made me this way, and therefore, you know, he'll have to just deal with it. Okay, really, it's God's fault if you're going to make an issue out of it. And we can't do that. We can't do that. Um, when God calls for confession, he's calling us to confess our own sins, not to lay the blame on others. Okay. And, and that becomes this huge struggle because it's so much easier and we're trained by our society and our culture to deflect our weaknesses, build on our strengths or our perceived strengths, to hide our shortcomings or to glory in things where we can say I'm a victim more than that person nowadays. And, you know, that's an odd kind of a thing. Um, and it's not to say that there isn't such a thing as being victimized, but we all are by sin. And we all need to own our brokenness rather than always keep blaming this, that, and the other person. So here, Adam blames Eve, but really the Lord. And so the Lord says, the Lord God said to the woman, so he moves along, what is this that you've done? And having learned well from Adam, but also with that enmity, rather than saying, yeah, it happened, um, she says, the serpent, the blame game, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So it's nobody's fault except God's and the serpent's, okay? The Lord God said to the serpent, okay, and before I go there, and, and so that's usually where we end up, all, God shouldn't have made me this way, or the devil made me do it. 
Okay. Or instead of the Devil Well Society and all these sorts of things, no, 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 as though we can have no ownership or can't make a change in the moment. And I'm not saying it's always easy, but we've we've uh, learned to deflect responsibility in so many ways within our society and our culture that we we fail to listen to what the Lord is speaking to us in order not only to crush that brokenness of sin by joining it to Jesus on the cross, but then also in order to renew us and piece the broken pieces of our lives back together again, according to his own image. This becomes part of the big struggle, the spiritual struggle that we have. Um, learn not to deflect the reality of your sin as we encounter that, as we hear God's word. Because what ends up happening is, is that the old Adam shuts down the working of the Holy Spirit. And see, this is that sin against the Holy Spirit that we heard about on Sunday in the Gospel reading, where the Holy Spirit really wants to put to death the brokenness in our lives in order to lead us into Christ so that we can be renewed in him. Okay, pull us out of ourselves into grace, into the one who died but then rose again, into the one through whom all things are made, the one who... Um, is making all things new. But instead, the tendency that we have is when, well, when we're confronted by the law, the moral law of Scripture, the law of God, um, and, and it pricks our own conscience and our own brokenness, we have a tendency to um, put up the wall, stop the working of the Holy Spirit, so that our broken self, like Adam and Eve, well, we hide from God saying he shouldn't be looking at that. Or, well, it's not as bad as what so-and-so has done over there. Or, you know, these sorts of things where in some cases we, we simply say, I don't need that because that, that broken piece of me is, is too dear to my identity um, that, that I'm not willing to give it up. But what are we saying when we say that? That this is more important than the gift of grace that abounds to us and that new life that is given to us in Christ. You know, because ultimately that's what it is. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit is to lead us to leave that behind and to come back to Christ as that gift of grace time and time again as a continuous cycle, which really isn't ever done on this side of eternity for us. But at the same time, to keep... Um, weakening that hold of our old broken self on the way in which we react to things in which we you know um, allow our pridefulness to kick into gear and all these sorts of things so that we can be recreated in Christ that's the work of the Holy Spirit always to bring us back to the words of Christ so here they hid from God they hid from each other or, or, or they hid from themselves in terms of being dishonest with themselves about what is right because it's so much easier to justify ourselves. And we do that throughout our days, throughout our lives. Um, learning not to do that is a very hard thing. And that's part of our spiritual battle. And then verse 14, the Lord God turns to the serpent and he says, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. So, he recognizes, and yes, the devil working through the serpent, you know, introduced that brokenness into the world. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat and all the days of your life. I will put enmity, there's that word, enmity between you and the woman. Okay, so first of all, between the serpent and between um, womankind, uh, if you want to say that, between your offspring and her offspring. But here's the gospel promise. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And that's a reference to ultimately Christ crushing the head of the serpent. Through the seed of the woman, basically the one born from a woman um, without the seed of a man. Because the scriptures are fully aware that, you know, you need both male and female to procreate. So here this enmity um, and that's that spiritual combat and ultimately between Christ and the devil, where it's through Christ that this is resolved. But in the meantime, we live with this enmity, which not only is there ultimately there between, okay, 
the way it shows up first between the woman and the serpent, but the way it also shows up with the broken relationship between men and women, okay? Even within marriage, marriages aren't perfect. Even Christian marriages aren't perfect. We know that. We know that. And, and you know, as we take a look at it, it, it's good for us to be honest about that and then to be able to take the broken parts and set them aside and to re go back to that source of forgiveness before it's a crisis, before we have to dig in our heels. And the pastors are there to help us work through that. But please don't wait until the last minute because usually, usually as pastors, we hear after you've decided to break up or these sorts of things. That's never a good time to start a conversation with your pastor about these things. Um, begin at the beginning so that we can work through things and strengthen that, that immersion in grace and learning to live that grace and to forgive one another and to die to our old broken selves. Okay. But that enmity, enmity that shows up not only between man and woman, the way it ultimately goes on and expands the way the Lord says about how work will become toilsome and all these sorts of things. Work becomes this thing which, which um, rather than being renewing and, and um, rejuvenating and becomes something that leeches us and it becomes something where there's an enmity and a struggle. And then as humanity continue to grow, of course, you have Cain and Abel where the two brothers and the one kills the other. Um, Cain kills Abel along the way because of enmity, he's jealous and these sorts of things. All the ways in which these, these um, the, the harmony of God's good creation was thrown out of whack. And we see that in the world. Um, we see that within our communities. We see that in the international world where, um, and, and we see it more and more, and this becomes a troubling thing within North American society where um, it, it's become um, canonized in the way in which, you know, universities talk about things within certain fields. Social sciences are very good for this, very bad for this, actually, where you're encouraged to build on your rage or your anger or your, your fear or your anxiety and then, you know, fight and confront. So that, you know, the idea is, is that somehow by confronting and by the enmity that comes out of that, we're going to build a better society. All we do is create further enmity rather than dealing with the core of our spiritual struggles. All we do is create further division rather than being able to um, come together in forgiveness. All we do is we magnify faults. Um, and, and it's not to say we ignore things um, you know, right after the right in the aftermath of finding those that mass grave at the the Kamloops Residential School, that's a horrific thing. It's a horrific thing. It should never have happened, um, but unfortunately, it did. And uh, you know, with all of the calls for accountability, certainly there there are places for that. But at the same time, as a society, um, we've we've moved so far away from humility recognizing our own brokenness and you know the gospel call to forgiveness to rest in forgiveness as it comes to us in christ and to share that with one another that along the way um we, we end up building on a, a social vision without forgiveness but only with competing um emotions competing political allegiances competing yeah, um, racial identities, competing this, that, and the other, rather than learning to come together um, to build one another up, which is really, you know, the whole baptismal image of the church, called together in Christ through repentance to the forgiveness of our sins, to die together with Jesus in the waters of baptism so we can be raised with him. There is no more, you know, Jew or Greek, and so, you know, the early Christian version of this racial politics um, there is no more of, of this battle that, that divides us on the basis of these things, but instead we are brought together not to erase, you know, gender or to erase our cultural background, but in order to embrace one another in that universal gift of salvation that comes to us from this Middle Eastern fellow, um, Palest not Palestinian likely, but Middle Eastern Isra Israelite fellow um, who calls us all, even those of us who are 
you know, from a European background, but everyone from every nation to be a part of that gift of salvation because all of us, well, drawing our lineage back, we have been made ultimately from the Father through the Son, through whom all things were made, like we say in our creeds, all through the, with the working of the Holy Spirit right at the beginning of creation so that, you know, our humanity is one humanity and our redemption is one redemption. And in the midst of all of that, rather than building on the enmity that can exist so easily, we're called to leave those things aside, you know, leave aside our anger, our fears, which sometimes cause us to build walls, our anxieties, which cause us to shut down our, you know, as we take a look at the way in which we, we play favoritism so often, or we have our social ruts where we define our space. And then, you know, there's a good so sociological theory called valorization theory, where, you know, we define in and out groups so naturally. We're all in the out group because we're broken, dirty, rotten sinners. We need to be honest with ourselves. Genesis 3, 8 to 15. But more than that, we're also called to be in the in-group as that free gift by grace. And learning to rest in that and to invite others to participate in that and to stop putting boundaries in between that God himself has not created so that the Holy Spirit can call people through repentance to share in that gift becomes that ongoing work of the gospel in our lives, in our congregations, in the church around the world, so that we can find that newness of life and that open door to heaven in and through our Savior Jesus Christ, the one that crushes the serpent's head, and the one that has beat down the devil for us. And in him, we already have that gift given. Let's spend some time you know, meditating on how that really intersects with you know, our lives and the way in which, well, our priorities can so easily get mixed up so that we can be, we can be drawn back to Christ. All right, I can keep rambling, but at this point in time, you know, there's enough there to chew on. It's a beautiful passage of scripture. It ties directly and speaks directly to the root of our own spiritual struggles. And, you know, it's my prayer that for each and every one of us that we learn to recognize those elements in ourselves, not in order to beat ourselves down, um, but in order to be drawn back to the foot of the cross and to be renewed and rejuvenated and transformed and transfigured by the one who died for us and rose again.